and welcome to this evening's SAVER event. I'm Mackenzie Smith, the University Librarian and Vice Provost for Digital Scholarship at UC Davis. And I'm Andrew Waterhouse, Director of the Robert Madavi Institute at UC Davis. We created the SAVER Lecture Series to bring UC Davis experts together with policymakers, industry, and thought leaders to discuss some of the most top pressing topics in food and wine being studied at UC Davis today. These talks contribute to the university's mission, not just to conduct groundbreaking research, but to connect that research with the public. This evening, we explore the effects of climate change on California's premier wine regions and how they can prepare for the future. We are honored to have UC Davis Chancellor Gary May with us this evening to open our program. Chancellor May is a highly engaged leader with a passion for helping others succeed. Throughout his career, he's championed diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has developed nationally recognized programs that support underrepresented groups in science, technology, engineering, and math. His vision as chancellor is to lead the university to new heights in academic excellence, inclusion, public service, and upward mobility for students from all backgrounds. Welcome, Chancellor May. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, on behalf of UC Davis, I'd like to welcome you all to our SAVER lecture series. We're hosting this event at a critical time for California's $75 billion wine industry. The United States ranks among the top countries in the world for producing wine, with the majority of that domestic wine being made in California. And right now, many vintners in the state are reeling. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused uh, economic disruption uh, with the supply chain and uh, the ability to reach consumers in tasting rooms. On top of this, the recent wildfires in California damaged a number of wineries during the heart of the harvest season. Some wineries have now opted to skip the 2020 vintage over fears of smoke taint. That's a tremendously difficult business decision for any winery owner to make. Now we have to ask if California wildfires in recent years are an aberration or part of the new normal. Some studies are showing that climate change is having profound effects on California's wine country that go beyond the prevalence of increasing wildfires. We're beginning to see that climate change might make parts of California too warm to grow its signature grape varieties, including Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. This is an urgent situation for the industry, but UC Davis is well positioned to help. Our research in uh, agriculture and food has been a specialty since our beginning as the university farm over a century ago. Now we're at the cutting edge of training the next generation of winemakers and enabling research to create a more resilient wine industry. Department of Viticulture and Enology is developing cultivation techniques that can help vintners uh, address climate change. We're researching sustainability practices so that wineries can use less water, which is critical as droughts become more common in California. And we've got the best wine library in the world right here at UC Davis which holds decades of valuable data on climate and grape growing. So I'm, I've been looking forward to this discussion on climate change and what it might mean for California wine. I certainly hope a good glass, uh, certainly enjoy a good glass of wine myself, uh, but today's panelists are, are the real experts. They include UC Davis faculty, a top Napa Valley vintner, and one of the leading voices in wine journalism. So thank you for joining us and, and stay safe. Thank you, Chancellor May. Now, tonight's topic relies on something you already know about grapes. They're very responsive to the environment. And certain places produce the very best wine because that place has the ideal climate for those particular grapes. Napa Valley right now is in the sweet spot for many grape varieties such as Cabernet and Chardonnay. However, how will the industry cope with climate change? And this question is not restricted to Napa Valley but think about all the wine regions you've heard of, Rioja, Burgundy, Chianti. <clears throat> There's a lot riding on the answer, and that's what we're gonna hear about tonight. Before we dive in, I'd like to remind everyone that if you have questions, as you listen to our speaker's presentations, you can use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions at any time. Our panelists will answer as many as possible at, during the Q&A period. Our first speaker, <clears throat> Tonight is Elizabeth Forrestell. She's an assistant professor in the UC Davis Department of Viticulture and Enology. Her research focuses on how grapevines respond to drought and heat stress. She's also started an international initiative 
focused on, on how vineyards can adapt to climate change with initial plantings in Napa and Davis to study grape varieties that could be used for winemaking under warmer and drier conditions. Beth, welcome. Thank you, Andy. I'm delighted to be here tonight um, to have this discussion with both Dan and Esther and all of you. It's a really amazing opportunity to work in a collaborative setting with people that are have insights into different aspects of industry. So first, I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the basics of the climate change and its effects on wine industry, and then some of my specific research. So I think the title of tonight's lecture begs the question of whether Chardonnay actually is vanishing. And so if we look across California, and these are the California crush reports that are put out by the state and USDA each year. In fact, Chardonnay is not really declining in terms of tonnage. And if we look in terms of premier wine regions, we look at Napa, this is from 1976 to 2020. Um, as far as percent of the total tonnage, Chardonnay has declined slightly and Cabernet has continued to increase. But when you look at just the total tonnage, um, because there's been more plantings in Napa through time, through the past several decades, you'll actually see that it is in fact been pretty steady in its plantings, whereas Cabernet Sauvignon has increased a lot. And so as of right now, despite the fact that we've had these quite dramatic changes in climate over the past several decades, we aren't making dramatic changes and in quite the contrary, we're actually homogenizing in terms of the grapes that we grow. And so when we consider what that means, I think we all are starting to consider whether it makes sense to maintain the exact plantings we have now, what are our adaptation strategies going forward, and so this isn't news to anyone in terms of these rapid changes and in increased mean temperatures. But I think that also it's important to note that 2020 is on track to rival 2016, which I'm sure you remember all as well too, to be the warmest year on record globally. And so this isn't anything that is changing in the near future, but while much of the media and much of the focus is on changes in mean temperature, we often think about the degrees relative to some base period, say 1980 to 2010, how much it's increased in terms of mean values. I think as far as viticulture is concerned, that's a little bit hard to grapple with because you wouldn't think that a small change like that would necessarily have a dramatic effect in terms of your viticultural practices and ability to make wine. But really beyond that, beyond just the mean warning, warming, there are many things that we need to adapt to um, in viticulture and enology. And that includes heat extremes. That's something that I'm especially focused on, drought and reduced water availability, um, pest and disease pressure shifts. And then of course, fire, which is really, it would be remiss to not mention that. Um, pending the last, the last few years. And what's really important to note is that this fire system is inextricably linked to the climate. So those heat waves you see are driving some of the fire and the aridity you see. And it's important to, to state as well that this is not just due to fire suppression, but actually, if you look at this gray baseline here, that's without anthropogenic climate change or human-induced climate change in terms of fuel aridity. And both fuel aridity and cumulative area burned has increased dramatically, not just because of suppression, but also because of changing climates. And so part of the focus of my research program is really understanding how heat waves or extreme heat events interact with warming and potential water demand. And so this panel on the left is showing you across California, the number of the increase in the number of heat waves, which is just characterized in this case as temperatures above 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit for three days in a row. Um, and this is from for 2080 relative to the current time period, 1980 to 2010. So the increase we'll see in the coming, in the coming next several decades. And you can see that there are many regions, especially the Central Valley, 
This is Napa highlighted right here. Then we're going to see this dramatic increase in um, heat waves. And so this is something where you're really moving outside of what we've experienced before. It's, it's anomalous to conditions that we've seen before. And this summer was extreme and, and that we saw many of them and especially in conjunction with the fires. Um, and similarly, what's really important to note is that that also means that we'll have shifts in water availability. So as it gets warmer and as we have shifts in precipitation, even if we have the same amount, the timing will be different. We're gonna have a huge increase in evaporative demand, meaning there's gonna be drying soils, and the warmth will pull water up through the plants um, more effectively and efficiently, which puts a lot of stress on both our natural systems and our anthropogenic systems, our human systems. And so it'll be a really critical time for navigating that as well. So if we focus in on this same figure, but looking at Napa, you can see not as extreme necessarily in the Central Valley, but to shift from having few or no heat waves in some of these regions to having up to nine or six or nine can be a really dramatic thing when you consider what that means as far as field conditions and growing conditions and implications for berry chemistry and wine and plant physiology. And similarly, this is replicated with how much evaporative demand there'll be. And so my research program and, and what I'll touch on a little bit today is, and hopefully have a discussion with Dan and Esther about as well, is what are the adaptive measures that we can take to deal with future climate change when we think about the grape and wine industry and especially the Permian region such as Napa. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the long-term adaptive measures first um, and then go into some of my work that talks about what we can do on the short term and th thinking about heat waves and water availability. So one um, project that I've undertaken that's supported by Warren Winiarski and in collaboration with Steve Mathiasen is this notion of advancing the Winkler index. And if you were here before the talk, you'll saw, you saw the slides show up of, of Amarine and Winkler who were both very renowned professors, some of the first professors in the department um, and viticulture and enology at UC Davis, and they spent two decades or more actually making vintages um, in a much more subpar winery than we have here today um, from 19, about 1930 to 19, mid-1950s. And they, using very sparse climate data and these um, fermentations and some of the chemistry, basic chemistry, primary chemistry of the berries and wine, they developed an index called the Winkler index, which is just merely a heat summation index, which has been a way to classify wine regions in California and across the world. Um, and oftentimes we have a pretty narrow, the, the initial index really wasn't able to do even what they wanted to set out to do. We didn't have the climate data and we didn't have the um, remote sensing data and all the other aspects of what we may need to actually characterize wine regions. And the idea behind it too was to match a variety, I should say, match a variety to a region. And so Napa, which has been characterized as all the way from one to region five, and I'll address that in a second, actually has more climatic and adaptive diversity than most regions. And it really spans almost all of what you see with the exception of the very hot areas and, California um, and some of the cooler regions, but it encompasses a really broad range. And this is the growing degree days, which is the heat summation index, the basis of the Winkler index. And you can see there's a ton of diversity across Napa. This is running up the valley. And so to redevelop this index with new data and with climate and weather station data, it's really critical to have weather station data, which we have up to 130 stations that are and wineries and growers across Napa, um, across the whole range for contributing to this project um, is to actually reclassify these regions to move beyond these, these Winkler regions to be able to assess what other characteristics such as radiation, heat waves, extreme events may be contributing to matching a cultivar with a region. And one of the primary ways that we 
often think about matching cultivars and regions, and this is the basis of the heat summation index, is that it takes a certain amount of warmth or to spur development and get to certain phenological stages to reach maturity. And we know that these classifications for how cultivars or varieties are meant to match certain climates. You generally would plant Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in cooler regions, and something like Cabernet, Grenache, or Mourvedre in warmer regions. And that's largely been the emphasis of research to date is to purely use phenology and use um, heat summation indices to match a region to a cultivar. But if we dig in a little bit more closely, this is some work that James Campbell carried out from the Waterhouse Lab and I'm working with him to analyze. And he was able to go across every Winkler region and span almost all of the sub AVAs in Napa from 2015 and collect berry chemistry and phenolics data from all of these regions. And if you look at how well growing degree days or a heat summation index can um, predict bricks, it does an okay job. Um, not surprisingly, the more warmth you have, the higher bricks you'll have, but there's a ton of variation there. And further, if you want to look at if it, how it captures other really critical and important properties of wine that are related to having structure and for that are targets for generating premier wine and high ranking wines, you'll see for things like tannins and anthocyanins, there's little to no relationship. Um, it's very weak. And so our aim is to tease this apart and look at other parameters and factors now that we have the ability to have such better data and then go ground truth this. Um, and so, as I said, we're collaborating with winemakers and growers to do this so we can tease this apart. And another effort, which I think will be really critical moving forward as we consider whether to maintain the varieties that we have and add a, adapt in place and work in that manner um, is, or if we decide to plant new varieties, which people are already slowly starting to do, um, is this international initiative that Dr. Waterhouse referred to. And what this is, is this is funded by both our department and then the Global Change Center at UC Davis. It's this replicated trial that will be in Napa and Davis. It's randomized and replicated, so it has a scientific basis. We can use it to actually study the physiological and functional basis of climate change responses. Um, and it's modeled after VidAdapt in Bordeaux. And we're replicating and using the same rootstock that they have in this project in Bordeaux that's been ongoing for the last 10 years. And then Adelaide will start one as well. And the aim is to expand international collaboration to understand how these cultivars that are, have potential for drought and heat adaptation that are lesser used, um, how they grow, production, if it makes economic sense, and then we'll have enough to also make small wine lots and do berry chemistry, analyze berry chemistry as well, because critically, we don't just want to match our cultivar to a region based purely on phenology, we really want to be able to know whether it can make good wine and if it has the capacity to do so. And if in viticultural terms, it's easy to work with and prune and get the productivity that you want and and some of the parameters you want in terms of berries and wine. So in addition to that, I think one other consideration we have to make is these short-term adaptation measures. And I'm gonna bring it to Lodi, which is a region, a very important wine region in California that's just east of here, where we're doing, which is warmer than it is in Napa, where we're looking at heat waves and the implications of how you can use irrigation to mitigate heat waves. And this is work that's being carried out by a graduate student of mine. And I just wanna quickly illustrate how just using the climate data or heat simulation index alone might lead you astray when you're actually trying to make changes when you consider berry chemistry and otherwise. And so this is just showing from our first year of data in 2019, how there were two extreme heat wave events, and this is the irrigation associated with it. And all we did was manipulate the irrigation during a very short time period. So just two days before 
and during the heat wave. And what we saw was a pretty dramatic pattern that the amount of water you apply, this is just maintaining deficit irrigation and then twice that for two to three days and then three times that is that you have a pretty dramatic reduction in both tannin and anthocyanins and you have early maturity if you do not provide supplemental water, but there's also a negative effect of applying too much water. And we saw this year where we had four heat waves, we saw a similar effect where you saw this decrease in anthocyanin, less so in the other treatment. And so I think this really illustrates the fact that we can use both adaptation measures in situ and think about water use and really optimize that um, in addition to some of these longer term strategies. And so going back to this notion of whether we should stick with Chardonnay, whether it will truly vanish, or Cabernet, which is what I've primarily focused on, or whether we can consider adapting and bringing in other varieties. And I just wanna bring up this notion too that I think both Dan and Esther will speak to is that not only are things changing in terms of the plant's ability to adapt, but of course our, our tastes and our preferences have changed through time. So. If you look at the weighted degree bricks for Cabernet and Chardonnay, of course, we may see some of that increase in sugar at harvest due to climate change, but I would also say it's likely due to preference. And so just quickly to close, as far as what the future holds for wine in Napa and for the world, I think there's the opportunity to utilize climatic diversity in regions that have it to maintain dominance of a few cultivars and that may be with increased inputs. Um, but there's also these options to integrate other cultivars into blends and choose better adapted varietal lines while trying to maintain consistent style. And lastly, um, and this is a bigger ask, but can we accept new styles, cultivars and flavors and adapt and expand our palate? And that's something that I think Dan and Esther will be able to speak to and we can have further discussion about. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all my collaborators and my lab members and funding. And I especially like to thank Warren Winiarski for his support for moving forward the Winkler Index. Thanks, Beth, for that really nice explanation of what the options are and what the situation is like in Napa Valley. Um, now we're going to hear uh, how this is playing out on the ground from one of the leading voices in the climate change discussion in Napa Valley. Our next speaker is Dan Petrosky. He's the winemaker at Lark Me Vineyards and founder of Massacan Winery. He's received widespread acclaim for his wines and in 2017 was named Winemaker of the Year by the San Francisco Chronicle. Last year, he planted an experimental vineyard at Lark Mead to test grape varieties from the Southern Hemisphere and Southern Mediterranean uh, and has called on his fellow winemakers to identify solutions to rising temperatures. Dan, welcome. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate being here. Um, Beth presented an incredible amount of information, which I would love to dig into very deeply here in this conversation, but we don't have the time tonight to do that. So I, I want to just give you a quick summary of how I got here and why it's important to me personally that we understand climate change as it speaks to not only Napa Valley, but to California's agriculture. Um, I'm a New York City kid, born and raised uh, with the seasons. And I kind of grew up um, in a blue collar family and, and went to high school and college in Manhattan, worked at a publishing company for 10 years. And during that tenure there, I worked for Sports Illustrated and Time Magazine. And a lot of that time was spent in advertising sales, marketing, and finance. So I, I got my MBA while I was there. And for me, it was all about understanding the kind of the trends and the markets and how people consumed information. Um, and a lot of that time, you know, communicating was uh, over glasses of wine. So I started to get very interested in wine and understanding the stories and the history of wine regions and not only in America, but also throughout the world. And while I did that, I started to, you know, kind of gravitate towards California because it was very easy for me to understand California. It was a, there was no language barrier and <laughs> there's my Brooklyn accent. Um, but it was, uh, it was very easy for me to kind of like navigate 
Napa and Sonoma. And Napa and Sonoma made it very easy, I hate to use that word again, for travel and tourism. And it was, you were able to walk in to learn the history of, of a sense of place and the people and the generations that were bringing, you know, California wine to the table. And as I became, you know, a little bit of a, a wine buff in my, my prior life, I finally ended up, um, you know, making that jump and that leap and that transition by having a bit of a midlife crisis in New York City, as most people do in their early ages, and moved to Italy and uh, worked on a vineyard for a year and then made my way back to, Cal uh, to the United States with the hopes and dreams and aspirations of being in the wine industry. Um, I wanted to be a wine sales and marketing guy. And, and, and with that, I decided it was uh, I, best to move to California and uh, extend my kind of my education. And I ended up making wine um, during a harvest internship in 2006 and landing a full-time job at Lark Mead in 2007 as a seller master and someone who was uh, managing and monitoring the seller activity. I was the only person here for 10 years in the cellar um, so what I did was I started to do what I knew how to do best, which was to start tracking data, start tracking information about winemaking, start tracking climate data. And I was fascinated, a kid coming from New York City with seasons, I was fascinated that I can play golf in February in California with, and, you know, walk the cor course and, and, and not worry about winter snows. So, I, I mean, climate was something that was like the California temperatures and climate was amazing to me. And, but then after a couple of years, um, and especially in 2008, when the, you know, the internet, intergovernmental you know, kind of panel on climate change you know, had been kind of releasing these reports since May 2006, and then a, a gentleman in, uh, in Oregon, Greg Jones, who works at Linfield College, which is a, a very big, uh, it's kind of the UC Davis of Oregon, and he was a, a director of education. He announced something in 2008 after helping write the report on uh, the IC, the IPCC uh, report in 2008, he announced that the best grapes in America in 2050 are going to be grown in the Rocky Mountains. So this is 2008, right? You know, we're you know we're this is pre this is just pre uh, you know uh, recession, and he announces that the best grapes in, in America will be grown in the Rocky Mountains in 2020. I don't think anyone at UC Davis, I don't think anyone in Napa Valley, Sonoma County. Uh, w you know, had thought about that at that time. Um, and Napa Valley Vintners, uh, an organization that is our political arm and our marketing arm for Napa Valley Vintners, said, oh, wait a second, the, great, the greatest grapes in America are grown in Napa Valley. And for someone to say that the near distant future, the best grapes in America are not going to be grown here, was a bit of an affront to our, everything we have done, everything the Napa Valley has created over time. So I actually got onto that climate task force in 2009, 2010. And what we found out very quickly is that we, the, the, the data and the science was, was actually accurate. Like things are going to change in the next, uh, in the next generation of, of, of wine grape growing in, in Napa Valley. And so I went from, I mentioned data there because I went from being you know, someone on the consumer marketing, finance and sales side who looked at data and looked at trends. And then I saw all this information coming out and I was like, wow, this is important. This is something that we need to be thinking about. So I was uh, at, the, at the early stages of my career and I kind of forgot about it for a few years until the 2014 earthquake hit, the first earthquake that I was ever uh, um, witness to. And then it wasn't just a 2014 earthquake that kind of uh, shook the Napa Valley and our wine grape growing. It was all the things that you started to think about that were extreme. And I started thinking about like the trends and the patterns of the of droughts that we were having. It seemed like there was a drought every three to four years in Napa and Sonoma. And then so 2014 happens, and then we go back into a drought in 2015. And then the winters of 2016, 17, we have the largest recorded rainfall in history in California. And that caused, you know, uh, that created vegetation for one of the greatest, the largest wildfires in 2017 in, in California history, but also at the same time, one of the deadliest wildfires in California history. And then 2018, 2019 rolls around and then 2020, we have fires again, and 50% of Napa Valley, Napa County on acreage has burned due to the LNU fires and the glass fires. All these extreme events have started to create, you know, these kind of hiccups in the trends and the patterns of where things were going. And so I, I, I've been spending a lot of my time since 2014 
especially since the fires in 2017 and thinking about the growing conditions of Napa Valley, it's like, where are we going to be in the next 10 or 20 years if we are battling this kind of this, this, you know, this, this trend line with, as Beth showed you, there's a lot of variability with how you grow grapes and what looks like, you know, anthocyanin and tannins and where these, where the data points are that are going to grow healthy and, and high quality grapes. So I started looking at all of that and started thinking about where we need to be as a community with regards to climate change. And I realized very quickly after that 20, 2008, um, you know, uh, IPCC uh, report and, and Greg Jones that the Napa Valley Vintners and my fellow community did the research, but at the same time, we weren't prepared to act on any of the research and the news. So we were just kind of complacent and it was, it was, a roar, it was the roaring 20s in the 2010 and moving forward. I mean, we were in a period of, of untethered growth in America and, and you can make, make and put a wine under cork and sell it for $100, $200, $300 a bottle and not be questioned about it and people were just consuming it. We were in this great, you know, kind of, as I said, there was a period of incredible untethered growth. And at the same time, I think a lot of that, we, we kind of lost, you know, the forest from the trees conversation about what the next, you know, I fell in love with wine because of history and family and generation and storytelling. And I felt that, you know, there was a period where we weren't stepping back from it all. So I started to ask questions and I started to look at data and I started to realize that we have a problem. Um, and that problem is this Winkler scale that Beth had brought up and this evolution of the Winkler scale that we need to be considerate of as we think about the next 20 to 30 years of Napa Valley and California's climate. It's not just the agriculture of the wine industry. Chancellor uh, Gary said earlier that, you know, California wine industry contributes to $75 billion in California. But I mean, so we have to be prepared. The $75 billion is because people buy California wine. Well, what are they going to buy if things are changing and we're not prepared to adapt and evolve to it? And the studies that are, that are happening at UC Davis, the things that I'm trying to implement here at Larkmead which over its 125 year history has had a 37 grape varieties planted on its property, um, to my knowledge. And in 1995, as we go back to this conversation with Chardonnay, in 1995, you know, 25 years ago, we had 30 acres of Chardonnay. We had 25% of our vineyard was planted in Chardonnay. Today we have zero. In less than 25 years, we have no Chardonnay. We had 20 acres of Chanon Blanc. We had 10 acres of Savignon Vert. We have less than 5% percentage points of our vineyard acreage land is white wine grapes. Why is that? A lot of reasons. It was consumer consumption patterns, you know, the roaring 80s, <laughs> go back to that term, uh, of vodka martinis and white wine. And then you go into, you know, the 90s and, um, and you know, the Parkerism and, and the big scores of, you know, the 1994 Harlan and 100 Point Wine and the Screaming Eagles of the World and the cult wine industry. And we shifted our entire, and then the phylloxera boom that came out of the 80s and into the 90s. We shifted our entire universe around market-driven economies and, uh, um, and those were red wines that were gonna build prestige and power um, in the pocketbook. And we, and we built an entire community on red wine and we should be built on red wine. We should be built on Cabernet Sauvignon over the last 25 years. But the next 25 years, that's not the case. Um, what we need to do is continue our dominance in this world as being a great wine growing region, which we are. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that we don't grow the best grapes in the world in that valley, without a doubt. It's just, I don't think we're growing the right grapes and we're not telling the right story about Napa Valley. And that's something, you know, we have to turn to, um, you know, my colleague and, and one of my, my respected peers in the industry, Esther Mobley, and, and, uh, and I'll get uh, Andy to kind of introduce her in a second. But I do think that we have a big conversation, you know, beyond the technicalities of climate change is to understand who we are as an American culture and consumption culture about what we want to drink, how we want to drink it, and where you know where it comes from. And I think Napa Valley is going to be in the forefront of that. Um, we just need to be able to adapt and evolve our storytelling, our marketing, our you know our, our idealism about who we are and what we're doing. It doesn't matter if it's Chardonnay or Cabernet. We grow the greatest grapes in the world here in Napa Valley. How do we communicate that moving forward? And hopefully. Um, 
Esther will help us <laughs> communicate that from her uh, from her position at the at the San Central Chronicle. So I'll turn it over to Andy, and then look forward to getting into the Q and A section with you all in a little bit. Thanks, Dan, for that uh, very revealing history of uh, viticulture in Napa Valley. Uh, <laughs> perhaps more revealing than uh, some of your your compatriots would, would have liked, perhaps. <laughs> But let's move on. Now we're going to hear from Esther Mobley. She joined the San Francisco Chronicle in 2015 to cover California wine, beer, and spirits. Her journalism has won broad acclaim, including from the California Newspaper Publishers Association, Association of Food Journalists, and the Lewis Roeder International Wine Writers Awards. Prior to joining the Chronicle, she was an assistant editor at the Wine Spectator magazine. Esther, welcome. Hi, Andy, thank you. And um, thank you so much to Beth and Dan for your thoughts. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of great minds thinking about this. So um, I can't tell you anything really about grape growing or winemaking that the two of them can't tell you, but um, I thought I would say a few words about uh, how I think wine consumers, who are the audience that I, I speak to in my work at the San Francisco Chronicle, might perceive um, the effects of climate change on California wine. And the, the, in the short term, um, the answer is I, I don't think consumers will really perceive much of a change. As, Eliz as Beth mentioned earlier, um, Chardonnay is not vanishing from California yet. Uh, it's still the most widely planted white grape here. There's about 100,000 acres of it planted throughout the state. And um, in fact, in the short term, um, in terms of wine quality, the, the quality of California wine has been extraordinarily high. In the peak of the recent drought, we saw some of our best vintages um, 2013, 2014, um, those were the years made beautiful wines. And um, in 2016, there was even a study put out by uh, collaborators at NASA and Harvard that suggested that um, rising temperatures over the last century had actually improved the quality of wines in France. They measured, um, they measured temperatures against ratings of of wine, of vintages by the British critic Michael Broadbent, and um, of course, if you're in a if you're in a cooler region, warmer temperatures might result in white, riper, more more fruity, uh, more luscious wines. We're seeing this play out in interesting ways throughout the world. Um, of course, England, which maybe decades ago, this is kind of the the classic example that gets mentioned a lot of the time might have seemed inhospitable to viticulture, now produces beautiful sparkling wines. And even here locally, um, I think we've seen some, some regions of California that might have been considered a little too chilly to produce great wines thrive in recent years and decades. Um, the, the coast of Sonoma is a great example um, higher altitudes, proximity to the ocean. We now consider those some of the great, great places to grow wine in the state. And um, of course, some of that is due to stylistic preferences shifting, but some of it I think is also due to these sorts of changes. So it's an interesting question that um, in the short term, especially if consumers are enjoying riper wines, higher alcohol wines, um, there may not be, you know, I think the concern is there may be a uh, few incentives to shift what the industry is doing because things are working right now. And I think Napa Valley Cabernet is such, a, such an interesting example of this because um, Dan is a winemaker who is thinking really long-term about what's gonna happen. I mean, 25, 30 years. Um, but the economy of Napa Valley and to some extent of uh, California's wine industry statewide really rests on Cabernet. And um, it's, Dan, you were beginning to talk about this, but it's a really interesting question. How willing are people going to be to shift away from the stylistic 
uh, the varietal identity that um, they've been building for the last 25 years. 25 years might not seem like a long time when you think about how long regions in other parts of the world have been uh, hewn to a specific grape variety. Um, in other places, it, it's, you know, in parts of Europe, uh, wine regions have kind of figured out that they're the sweet spot for a certain type of grape variety for over 500 years. Um, so it's new here. Um, but one thing I know Dan and I have discussed this before when I've been reporting on what he's done at Larkmead with his experimental plantings is, I mean, I think one question is, can, can the regions be a little more flexible and nimble about what they grow? So um, Bordeaux, for example, is, is much less tied to the grape varieties in its wines than Napa Valley is. Napa Valley is so strongly about Cabernet Sauvignon. Is there a way to shift it to be Napa Valley red wine? And that's the brand. And that's uh, the, the category that people, um, that people seek out. And can those wines command the prices that Napa Valley Cabernets currently can, but might the red wine be not Cabernet or not entirely Cabernet or not mostly Cabernet? Might it include Tempranillo, for example? Um, I think those are questions that uh, we really have to ask ourselves. And this isn't unique to California. I, I think most of the wine growing world has kind of understood its path to success as establishing a logic for grape varieties in their very particular idiosyncratic climate and soils. And I, I mean, I think this really requires a paradigm shift to think about, uh, you know, these identities that, that, that wine regions, marketers, uh, winemakers have worked so long to establish and, and deeply understand, understand what makes sense um, as the world shifts and turns and, and warms. Um, and becomes more erratic, uh, it's, I think it's, it's really hard work. It's not easy work to think about these things. Of course, um, you know, this to some extent is, um, is, is addressing on, only one of the paths that Beth discussed, this idea of alternative varieties, and that's not the only way forward. Um, Beth, your research shows there's a lot of ways forward with the varieties we currently use and um, ways to, to adapt our, our current palette of grapes to um, the world as it's changing. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I, that, that was kind of the main thing I wanted to, to address is the question of alternative grape varieties. And I think too, um, I'm interested in the, the question Beth mentioned at the end of adapting to different flavors. And uh, that's something I'm fascinated by. I think we do, our, our collective palette as a society does shift over time. And um, I think it's a very interesting question of whether, you know, wines, right now we have a, a, a very specific idea of what a great wine from California tastes like. Uh, that has a certain equilibrium of acid and uh, alcohol and sugar at, at harvesting. And um, I don't mean that, that it's so specific, but I, you know, a few decades from now, could we actually have a very different, could we welcome a, a wine that somehow bears some marks of climate change, assuming the plant is viable. I think that's, that's the first step. Um, and I, I think uh, most, of, most of what else I was going to address has been addressed by Dan and Beth. So I may allow us to move on to the Q&A session if that's all right. All right, thank you very much, Esther. Um, I think that was a really good analysis of what got us thinking anyway about the market uh, because adaptation by producers to the market is going to be key to their, their success going forward. Um, I'd like to start with one question that just gets back to something you've all touched on 
Um, and, and I think we just want to put this question to rest, actually. Um, what, what, how soon do you, do you predict that we actually won't be able to grow Chardonnay in Napa Valley? Is, does anybody want to try to answer that question? And we got lots of other questions about different varieties. Um, I'll, I'll go with that one. I, I actually, Andy, I don't, I believe that Chardonnay has got a, a long his, a long life here ahead of us. Um, I think the one thing that we don't do very well with breaking out the great crush report is breaking out Chardonnay as a variety for sparkling wine, especially in Napa Valley. You have uh, two international uh, sparkling wine houses, Mum and Chandon, and, and actually three you know, with Tatinje. And then you have the domestic uh, Schramsberg, which make a tremendous amount of wine, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases of sparkling wine with Chardonnay at the core. Um, with regards to still Chardonnay, like still wine Chardonnay, you have very small regions of, of the Napa Valley that are still producing Chardonnay at high qualities and, and it's mostly in Carneros these days. Um, and then you have still the, the, you know, I think we, we all, El Molino came to the forefront during the glass fires. Um, they are, they're still one of the, the great Chardonnay producers in the core and the heart of the Napa Valley and, uh, and, and just outside of St. Helena. So I don't think that Chardonnay is going to go away if you think about sparkling wine production. Okay. Any, any comments for anyone else? No? Okay. Well, does it depend on if we ship the Winkler index? Beth? In terms of suitability? Yeah. I mean, as of, if you look, a cursory look at it would suggest that we don't use the Winkler index. So we're already, there are already many varieties that should not be fitting in the region where they're primarily produced and where very high quality wine is produced. So, which speaks to some of the fact that it, it needs to be modified. Um, I do even, I do think that then you ask, one thing we have to consider is that Chardonnay is also really intensive in terms of some of what needs to be used as far as pests or disease and powdery mildew. And there are these aspects of it too, that if we, we didn't really talk about sustainability and I think that's hard to approach from a marketing perspective, but if we keep on keeping on if you actually look at the like the water you need or some of the inputs you need, when will that tipping point be that it isn't possible, even economically, to do some of the things we're doing? And I think that's a relevant part of the question too, which is a really hard one to address and think about, but. Uh, well, Beth, we've got an irrigation question. Do you think the irrigation availability might be the limiting factor in um, you know, being able to produce those grapes uh, and the quality that uh, we, we're accustomed to? I think it depends on the region. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of politics behind water, as we all know, but there are already situations where agriculture, there are already these sort of water wars where there's situations where access to water by people in the Central Valley is not more important than access by agriculture. And, and also too, there's a recent study that just came out that showed that shifting snowpack and water availability and groundwater is gonna shift so dramatically in the coming decades that we will not, and grape was one of the, the um, commodities that will be most hit in July. And it's not even that precipitation is that different, but it's the timing of precipitation and that we won't actually have the snowpack that we need. So I think there are regions, especially in the Central Valley, where it will be this issue of it, it's, it may not be possible. And water, I believe, will have to become, through Sigma and other means, a lot more expensive, which will choose what decisions people make. All right. Um, well, now we have a number of questions around, I think this goes to Beth and Dan about what varieties you're thinking might be suited for, uh, you know, a future in Napa Valley. Uh, what have you planted? Uh, what do you have in your garden, et cetera? So lots of interest in that. Do you want to start that one, Dan? Sure. Um, so I, I, you know, I come from the winemaking perspective as a, a consumer of wine first, foremost. 
Um, I don't have an academic training to understanding grapevine and viticulture and and or winemaking and fermentation. I think about the finished product. I think about what's going to be in my glass um, when I'm uh, when I'm making wine and when I'm potentially drinking that wine down the road. So I started looking at, you know, what we've done here, you know, with quality grape growing and viticulture over the course of the last 25 years, since literally since the phylloxera boom in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And we've become these really wonderful um, uh, manufacturers of grape vines. Um, but, and at the same time, we kind of narrowed ourselves down. I love that Esther brought up the idea that Napa Valley started as, uh, you know, this idea of like Napa Valley red wine when you know the harlands of the world and the screaming eagles and the opus one they didn't rely on a singular grape variety they relied on this idea that napa valley was growing great red wine grapes when you go back to the you know you go back to the, the early slides if anyone checked in before we uh, we started the seminar they talked about hanzel making chardonnay in, in sonoma county in the 1950s 1960s Think about what the greatest wine growing regions in the world were in the 1950s and 1960s. It was Burgundy and Bordeaux and maybe some Riesling from Germany. There weren't many options in front of us at that time. There weren't many availability. I grew up in New York City in the 80s and 90s and early aughts. And the wines we drank were Bordeaux wines. We drank Burgundy wines. We drank Rhone wines. We drank very limited palate. Today, 20 years later, 2020, our palate is so broad. Our understanding of wine is so broad. And as I think about the changing of the American palate, I think about the evolution of the American palate and moving away from things like Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon and thinking about what those, a sense of place. We all think that terroir is this idea of sense of place. Well, we're sitting here talking about Chardonnay and Cabernet. We're not, we're not necessarily talking about Napa Valley. <laughs> we're not talking about Bur you know, Sonoma County. I, when you talk about those regions, you talk about the wines that come from those regions with, from an understanding of 170 years of grape, you know, grape growing in Bordeaux, we've been growing Cabernet in California and in Napa Valley at, at its extreme levels to where we are today, 50% planted for 25 years. We are far from understanding like what the greatest grapes to be grown in this community are. And unfortunately, we're at, you know, it's a coincidence we're at the same time with this massive evolutionary change with our climate. So you talk, you, you, for me, talking about what grape varieties we're growing today, I think about what is Napa Valley gonna sell at the $200, $300, $400 dollar price point, like Harlan's and the Screaming Eagles of the world, which are even five to thousand dollars. I think of great wines of the world, like Vega Sicilia from, from Spain. I think of uh, Massa Verdino from Southern Italy. I think of Barcavella from Portugal. And those are Tempanillo and those are Alianico and those are, um, those are uh, Tariga Nacional. I think of Shiraz, I think of Grange. I think of these great wines of the world that, you know, in, in the 50s, Hansel was emulating Burgundy. Bob Mandavi in the 60s was em emulating Bordeaux. Well, why can't we be emulating Spain and Italy and Australia and Portugal and produce some of the greatest wines in the world? Today's model is completely different than it was when Bob and Davi and, 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 and those, I mean, the founders and the Warmanarskis were making wine here in Napa Valley. They had two or three reasons to emulate. We have the entire world to emulate and we have more data and more understanding. And that's why I'm so happy that the Winkler scale is going through an evolution because it's gonna teach us that we don't have to be tied to a singular message or a singular variety. That monocultures are gonna be dead in 20 to 30 years. We have to, we have to evolve. And, and that, you know, and it's a, it's a long answer to a short question, but it's a very, I'm very passionate about it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean a singular, you know, stamp of a singular grape variety. I think it's bad marketing to be, tie yourself to Cabernet Sauvignon if you're in the entire Napa Valley. I think that's just terrible marketing. Um, just, you know, <laughs> let me teach one of your marketing classes at UC Davis and we can go through the details as to why that's true. But <laughs> I'll turn it over, I'll turn it back to Beth if she has a more scientific approach towards that answer. Yeah, you know, Beth, what do you think? So I'm, as I inappropriately answered in the text box, I, there are, I have a list of 120 varietals that I have worked on through talking to winemakers, viticulturalists um, all over the world. And, and I continue to ask people, and these are those that are gonna be grafted for this trial of 60 to 80 cultivars. I, 
I'm hesitant to name names. I mean, we know that there are ones like, like I can say, Sertico, Saparavi, Triga Nacional, Charbono, like Tempranillo, there are all these ones. And then I'm like sitting there and I'm like, oh, but I'm so obsessed with Schioptino. But then I know now that it sucks to grow, excuse my language. So, but, but there are phenomenal wines made from it. So my, from what my aim is from a scientific perspective is, and whether I can, do this or not is yet to be seen, but it's critical to work with a really diverse group of people to do so, is not necessarily just purely distill down and characterize. Yes, we want better heat tolerance. We want water tolerance. We have amazing people in our department working on all these things too, um, from many different angles. But that once you, the, the reason for these gardens too, and to have these new cultivars and to put some that put them in Napa and I'm hopefully putting it in Lodi too and and is to actually have exposure to new cultivars and let's see if we can give something to people that we can actually model the economics of does it grow well can you get good production maybe we can't get the same prices per bottle for some of them but maybe you can produce enough that then economically that makes sense and that there are fewer inputs in the vineyard um, I think there's all of these pieces that are so relevant that and there's so many interesting, there's so much interesting wine in Napa in and of itself that people are making and people are doing really exciting things beyond what I think is on the shelf in many areas for Napa. So I don't know, I, I hate to, to say a few cultivars, I just want to do as much work as I can to provide the basis and through our department, I want us to do that so that we can provide resources and actually make it publicly available and tools available so that people can grow new varieties and make money and make good wine. So if that's, and that's why working like talking with people like Esther and Dan and others has been, I, it's to me, it's so critical for even from the scientific perspective, so. Right. So um, now Esther, uh, you brought up, first brought up, and I think this idea is sort of bouncing around of, of a Napa appellation. In other words, in Europe, if you grow, if you make a red wine in Burgundy, you have only one grape you can use, which is Pinot Noir. If you grow something else, then you can't call it Burgundy. And you know, a way to deal with this is to have a particular wine style that's defined, say, as Napa Valley. And, you know, it could include a list of specific varieties and the wine has to be made in a specific way. And I'm wondering, are you, are you thinking this could actually happen? Because traditionally Americans have really shied away from this kind of what I, what's, what's called a controlled appellation. Do you think that's in reach in uh, not so distant future? Well, um, I, if it sounded like I was advocating for that, I'm, I'm not. And I think if anything, um, um, the emphasis should be on greater flexibility for American wine regions, not uh, diminished flexibility. I think, I mean, I think that's what distinguishes us from Europe um, or from many European regions. I, you know, but to some extent, there is an Appalachian Napa Valley um, and it's an economic restriction. You can't afford to plant anything other than Cabernet in Napa Valley anymore. The economics of buying land, of uh, operating a wine business there, and the difference in price that Napa Valley grapes and wines can command if they're Cabernet Sauvignon as opposed to any other grape variety pretty much dictate that, uh, that most of the valley is planted to Cab. Um, I think that's where it becomes really interesting when winemakers like Dan and, and uh, the team at Spotswood and other wineries in the area and Andy Beckstoffer, who's invested a lot of time with your colleagues at UC Davis in trying to figure out new uh, ways to plant and cultivate cab. Um, it, that's where it becomes really critical that people think about this proactively because right now it's, it's working. Um, I mean, we can talk about the catastrophic events that climate change has wrought recently, fires, extreme heat events, uh, drought, et cetera, but um, the wines still taste really good. The grapes are still growing well. I, I mean, that's kind of what I was, what I was trying to say. So um, 
I, I just think that it's in uh, not only Napa Valley, but every wine region's interest to keep its options open because, um, I mean, Dan mentioned how brief the history of Cabernet and Chardonnay success is really in any part of California. It's, it's such a short period of time that we've, we've been making these wines here. And then um, just with what we know about how quickly the world is changing now, um, I think it would be a mistake also to tie uh, Napa Valley's identity to Tariga Nacional or Alicante Boucher or Vermentino if we decide that those are grape varieties suited to the next 25 years because who knows, to me it's like then who knows what happens after that. They, you know, who knows? So um, I just think, I, so I don't think there should be Appalachian restrictions. I think there should be, um, I mean, I, I think what it is, is Dan has been saying, it's an emphasis more on place than on variety. Right, and, and let me throw this back to Dan because if you're going to market a name, like let's just say Napa Valley red wine, or just Napa Valley wine, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be red. When you pick up the bottle, you'll see it's red. Then how do you, how do you define that? So I mean, or do you try to define that in some way so the consumer knows what they're getting? I mean, that's that's the advantage that that Mondavi and others, you know, brought with the with the varietal names. It was a simple decoder. Right, you knew if it was Cabernet was going to have a certain taste, and so that works. I mean, unfortunately, no one can remember all the possible varieties, so we end up with a short list. I think that's a drawback of that system. But how are you going to define what Napa Valley red wine is um, if you abandon the, the Appalachian or the, the varietal names? I, I, that's a good, very good question, Annie, and, and I do think that we as Americans wanted to have a deeper understanding of what was in the bottle. So we, you know, no one, you know, I love going to a party and, and opening up and it sounds really douchey, but uh, opening up a bottle of Aubryon and being like, hey, what do you think? And then people find out it's 55% Merlot and they're like, whoa, that's Merlot. And, and like, no, you're not supposed to drink Merlot, right? And um, I think that was the kind of the irony of, of Sideways at the end of, of Sideways, the movie. But um, no, I do think that we have to start thinking about Napa Valley as this kind of this, this luxury place. And don't get me wrong when I, I don't, mock me for saying luxury, but you know, Napa Valley produces two and a half percent of the wines purchased in America. At that point, we are luxury. Um, we are at the top of the pyramid of wines being grown and produced in this country um, and consumed. So we have to think about Napa Valley as a definition of luxury. And that, and that definition is going to be about artisanship. It's going to be about history. It's going to be about place. It's going to be about quality and consistency over time doesn't need to be Cabernet Sauvignon or Chardonnay. It needs to be the fact that when you buy a bottle of Napa Valley wine, you trust what's in that bottle is going to be delicious and it's going to be well-made. And there's been no better time than today than to drink the wines of Napa Valley. And I'm not saying that as a, as a, as a, a staunch supporter of the Napa Valley Vintners at all. I'm just saying that is that like we are at a point in time where we're making the best wines we've ever made. Um, from top of Napa Valley to the bottom of Napa Valley. And the wines are delicious. And I think that we just have to create continuous, we've already, we've already put ourselves on the top of the pyramid and it's just about that quality and consistency. And like, I don't, I don't you know, to your point, Andy, like, I don't go to buy Burgundy or Bordeaux and, and start asking questions about what varieties are in there. I go in there to buy the story, the history, the place, the generational change of 16, you know, switch to Tuscany and the 16 generations of the Antonori family. Like I trust that 16 generations strong are gonna produce a great, delicious tasting bottle of wine. And I will buy, I'll put my money against that Sangiovese uh, and put it on my table every night. And I think that's what wine, great wine grape growing regions are gonna do, is gonna create trust. And I think Napa Valley is, is um, we've created the trust. We just have to break out of this you know, idea that, you know, and then just goes back to Esther's point. 25 years from now, Tariga Nacional might be blown out of the water for something else. We just have to create trust that this region is going to produce quality and excellence year over year over year over year. And that's what we've been doing for the last 25 years. And I don't think it's going to stop. We just have to just get off the, the variety train. 
So can I interject and ask a question from my perspective to both Dan and Esther? And this is something that I come up against just when I'm in my look naive, I'm not a winemaker mode and people, are, you know, there's that resistance like, oh, switch varieties, That's, you know, there's, there's huge resistance to that, especially coming from someone from my perspective. So who, where does the burden lie as far as if we we know it's not economically viable right now from in terms of like cost of someone can't go to Napa and decide I'm just going to pull up this and plant something else and think I'm going to sell these grapes for the same price or be able to make wine is the is the burden lie on the winemakers that already have a presence and a name I think that there's some people who are taking that on obviously um, case in point but but where the consumers demanding something different like where do you see the the burden lying on not that it's a burden I mean I think it's something that could be really positive but from both of your perspectives I wonder how you see that moving well I think this happens in conjunction with figuring out how to how the type of work you're doing and figuring out how to make Chardonnay and Cabernet adapt more adaptive to the situation at hand. And the idea may not be to suddenly rest on non-Cabernet wines in Napa. And we're just using Napa Cabernet as an example, but maybe the idea is to have a little, you know, a blend of Cabernet that also includes Tariga Nacional or something. And then we end up with, you know, somehow approximating continuing the thread of the style of Napa Valley that people love to drink. And maybe those types of baby steps are easier to communicate to consumers, easier for wineries to adapt to. They don't pull out their entire vineyard all at once. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some burden lies with, with me and my peers in communicating to consumers and recommending wines to consumers and trying to help them understand what they're drinking. And um, I mean, we're talking about like a red blend as if it's a some novel concept. <laughs> Obviously it's not. And actually these kitchen sink red blends have, have been a kind of meteoric uh, popular style of wine in recent years. And we have Meritage blends all through Napa Valley that include other Bordeaux varieties. So, um, I, you know, to some extent, this is like just, um, it's, it's, uh, just the same thing we've been doing for a long, <laughs> a long time. And Napa is unusually closely tied to a, a grape variety, right? I mean, like even in Sonoma, where you think they've developed this incredible reputation for high quality Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, there's like a lot going on there still that's not either of those grape varieties. So um, I think to some extent, like this idea of the stylistic identities, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts of California that have maintained a lot more flexibility and can, you know, can kind of shift with the tides uh, without doing such heavy lifting from a, a marketing perspective. Um, I'm going to, we're going to, we don't have too much time left. I did want to there have been a few other questions about, uh, are there specific California varieties people are familiar with that, um, you know, are, are we already know do well in, in a warmer climate such as Zinfandel? Or can you name a few that varieties that we already know will probably be uh, here in 20, 30 years? Yeah, well, that goes, to, that goes back to a little bit of what we're planting as, a, as experimental blocks here at Larkmead. Um, we, we dedicated two and a half percent of our vineyard this past year to research and development for the future. And it's actually sometimes you have to take a step back to look forward. And I do think that grape varieties like Zinfandel and grape varieties like Petit Syrah and Chenin Blanc, which were pro prominently planted throughout the Napa Valley and throughout California, and especially here at Larkmead over its 125 year history, um, we are actually revisiting those grape varieties. Um, we think that you know, as this, uh, this, this conversation about 
um, accumulated heat and warming continues and shifts towards the Napa Valley in the next 20 to 30 years. Grape varieties that are doing really well in, in the Central Coast and uh, the Central Valley, like Zinfandel, like Petit Syrah, are going to offer the salt and pepper and the, and, the, and the kind of anthocyanin and the tannin, you know, to making those red wine blends. So we're, we're super excited about looking backwards to look forward, but we're also looking at the, you know, the, the Winkler scale and with regards to the, the Southern Mediterranean and the Southern Hemisphere as to what grape varieties are doing well. But look, I plant, I, I took the, took the, the past and then I took 50% of the future and 50% of my future is all about thinking about the wines that we sell at a very high price point and what other wines, great wines of the world. If I was Bob Mondavi 1967 building a winery, but now it's 2020 and I'm Dan Petrosky, what grape varieties would I be considering in Napa Valley? And those would be the Tempranillos because I look at a wine like Vegas Cecilia, which sells wine for 99%, more, you know, the mo more expensive than 99% of all the other Napa Valley wines. And if I'm gonna create that pinnacle of success and, and achievement, I would look towards that. So I'm, I wouldn't shy away from, you know, the great wines of the world as a, as an opportunity to move forward. All right. Um, so for our last question here, um, I have a couple options. I think I'm going to ask um, if, if there's any, um, are there any regulations that could help uh, producers um, adapt to this, uh, to this climate change? You know, are there any policies that, that uh, I don't know, the county could enact or the, the state that might um, allow or encourage producers to to, to adapt to, or plan to adapt. Got any ideas on that? I, I will just echo what Esther said. If I do hope that we as an organization uh, of grape growers, uh, whether it be from the Napa Valley Vintners or Napa Valley Grape Growers, or we just continue to petition for more flexibility as we move forward, we have to evolve. Um, and I think that evolution is going to, under an unforeseen future, in agriculture and not only in California, but in the world, we have to be more flexible. So I do hope that um, we have open minds as we move forward in, in this process. And, um, and I thank Esther for bringing that up earlier because I think it's important from a journalistic point of view in the position she holds to be able to kind of uh, support that idea in print. Any thoughts on that, Esther? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I think, um, I don't know. There's, there's all kinds of things, ways that the government can help with um, things like wildfires. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of talk right now about how, uh, you know, how, how wineries can be supported by, I know Congressman Mike Thompson's working on a lot of stuff, for example. Um, but, uh, but I don't know, in general, beyond that on a regulatory note. All right, well, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, I wanna thank you all for um, uh, this great discussion we're having and uh, I'll turn it over to my co-host, Mackenzie Smith to close us out. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you all. This has been a really, really fascinating conversation. I especially wanna thank Andy for uh, moderating this evening. And I really wanna thank all the staff of the Robert Mondavi Institute and the UC Davis Library who've been working for months to organize this evening's program. Uh, and finally, thank you for attending. We will post a recording of this event in a few days so you can share it with family, friends, or colleagues who might be interested in this topic. And we hope to see you at a future SABER event. So keep your eyes posted for um, an announcement of upcoming winter program events in which we will explore the science of aroma and how it contributes to our experience of food. I know I'm looking forward to that very much. Finally, please take a moment to leave your feedback or suggestions for future events in the brief survey that you get when you log off. Thank you again and have a great evening. Good night.